Hi, I'm Jeff Sickinga, Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center, and this is The American Idea, coming to you from Peter Schramm's library in Ashland, Ohio. In this podcast, we explore America's crisis in civic education. Too many people today don't understand the history and principles that make us Americans. So we're here to explore America's history and principles and what they mean for today, what we can learn from them, and how we can restore them to their rightful place in our hearts and minds. We think it's the most important thing we can do as Americans to keep our experiment in self-government alive. So thank you for joining us in this important conversation. You can learn more about Ashbrook and the work we're doing with students, teachers, and citizens at ashbrook.org. I want to welcome everybody to this episode. Today we're joined by a very special guest, Congressman Bob Gibbs. Uh, Congressman Gibbs represented, served in the Ohio legislature, in the Ohio House and Ohio Senate, and then represented Ohio's seventh district in the U.S. Congress. Uh, Congressman Gibbs, thank you for taking the time to join us. I'm glad to be here with you, Jeff. Um, your biography. It's, it's an interesting one. Every member of Congress comes from a, a certain district with a certain background. But yours in particular is interesting, I think, maybe to some of our listeners, because you actually came out of the agricultural sector before you went into public service. Yeah, well, it's even more interesting. I didn't grow up in the agriculture sector. I grew up as a city kid and became, got involved in the agriculture sector, which is very unusual. And just for a piece of trivia, American Farm Bureau actually researched this, but I'm the only former Ohio State Farm Bureau president elected to Congress in the history of American Farm Bureau. Wow, how about that? How does a city kid become a farmer? Well, I, you know, I, I worked on a garden center back in high school and I got involved. I, I liked the outdoor, I, I, of course, at a garden center, I got involved with trees and plants and, and, and nursery stuff. And then uh, there was an opportunity that they, they, Ohio State opened a, a new ag school in Worcester at the time I was in the first graduating class. And I went down there and, and I did some work you know, studies and worked in dairy farms, and I got more interested in swine production because of the, at that time the capital cost were a lot less than trying to get into dairy production. And uh, bought first farm in 1975 and started uh, uh, raising pigs. And I was uh, working at the same time for five years at the Ohio Agriculture Research and Development Center at the swine farm, and mm-hmm. and uh, got a lot of good experience. And uh, that's all that happened. So then how do you go from being a farmer and being uh, su- successful in agricultural business to then becoming a member of the Ohio legislature? Well, what happened, I, I, I got involved with the Ohio Farm Bureau and I uh, served in the local committees and I was county president and the opportunity came up and I ran for the state board of trustees and I got elected. And so I tell people, if you don't like where I was in public office, you can blame the Ohio Farm Bureau, because that's where I got my public policy experience. And because I didn't go to school studying political science or any of that, I stuck, I studied livestock production. And went, and so I went through that. I was on that board for I mean, almost 20 years and president for a couple. And then uh, opportunity opened up uh, under redistricting in the early 2000s of a new Ohio House seat, open seat. And I was encouraged to run. I did. And so I guess the rest is history. How that. about that? <laughs> so then how do you go from serving that in the Ohio House and then in the Ohio Senate to deciding to be run for Congress and get elected to Congress? That was quite an interesting experience. Um, I was a sitting state senator, and uh, I was upset at my congressman at the time. That was the old 18th Congressional District before redistricting in 2012. And I was not happy with his votes. And so I got my other two state senators that... Our three Senate districts pretty much uh, comprised of the congressional district. The 18th congressional district was 16 counties, 12 full, a lot of southeastern Ohio at the time. And I sat them down and I said, one of us has got to run because I don't think anybody else is going to run. That was my exact words. And the one senator said, my wife won't let me. And the other senator said, I don't want to. He says, you do, you run, Bob, we'll support you. <laughs> and so I kind of got drafted in a deal. And then after I got in the race, seven other people decided to run the Republican primary, and I didn't think anybody was going to run. <laughs> so I had a very contentious Republican primary, and, and most of the candidates were, you know, viable candidates. And uh, I think I won by, uh, I think it was 154 votes out of 54,000. Wow. Wow. That first was very close. Uh, when you got to Congress, 
What were your priorities as a legislator, legislator or coming into Congress? Well, my priorities was I was concerned about one reason I ran was because they passed Obamacare and they passed uh, cap and I call it cap and tax, cap and trade, where they're going to put uh, taxes basically on your carbon emissions or whatever. And my congressman, you know, was supporting that at the time. And and obviously, I my ag background, and farm bureau background, I, I was involved in ag. And of course, Speaker Boehner from Ohio, being the speaker, he told me I was going to be an ag committee. I didn't have a decision about that. <laughs> uh, that was quite blunt uh, discussion. Uh-huh. Uh, and then, uh, so I got involved in uh, uh, transportation and infrastructure committee and ag. And in Congress, you know, any legislative body, the communities you're involved in, you kind of take on those issues a little bit more because you're involved with it. So then I got involved on, in, in the transportation side on the water stuff, water issues, maritime transportation, uh, EPA stuff. And my first six years in Congress, I was privileged to be chairman of a subcommittee. It was called the Water Resource and Environment Subcommittee. And we had jurisdiction of the Army Corps engineers, so all those infrastructure projects they do, mostly the water stuff. And then uh, the water side of the EPA, and we also had the Tennessee Valley Authority, St. Lawrence Seaway, and Brownfields. So I did a lot of work, especially with the Army Corps engineers and the water side of uh, EPA. And when uh, President Obama put in that WOTUS for Waters of the United States, I was one of the lead people in the U.S. House of Representatives to fight that. And when President Trump got elected, he signed an executive order. I went to the White House in the signing, and I was part of that. And uh, I wish... One of the things I do regret that we never got that codified. I was pushing to get that codified because I said at some point we might get a president that wants to back back the other way, the wrong way, take people's landowners' rights away. And now we're seeing that now with President Biden because he's reinstituting uh, all or part of that WOTUS rule. Some legislation that you were involved in in Congress that you were most proud of. What would what would that be? Well, I think the water stuff. Um, we passed a, a, a big bill. You don't hear much about it because it's not all that controversial. But in 2014, we passed what we call the Water Bill, and we had an extra R in here because it was called the Water Resources Reform Development Act. Uh-huh. And we reformed a lot of the processes that the Army Corps engineers goes through in determining and, and funding uh, all these projects. I'm talking about projects like on the river system, the locks, the dams, uh, dredging, uh, 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 you know, ports around the United States. I've probably met, in my time in Congress, I think I met every port director of ports, you know, both, you know, ocean and inland ports in the United States. And and, uh, so we passed that bill. I passed another bill that helped municipalities with uh, issues with their municipal sewage treatment facilities with the EPA. Uh, One thing I'm also proud of is uh, it wasn't in my district, but it was in the state of Ohio. It was important in my district, uh, the Port of Cleveland. The Port of Cleveland, uh, part of that port, it's just not just that on the lake side, but six miles up the Cuyahoga River is part is a federal waterway, part of the Port of Cleveland. And up that waterway, uh, that river, there's uh, two blast furnaces and other industry. And that river has to be, that six-mile stretch, that river has to be dredged twice a year or else uh, they can't get the products in and out. And, that's, and that is the largest economic driver in northeastern Ohio. Wow. And... and uh, they were the court said they weren't going to dredge it anymore, and I convened a meeting after some discussion with the uh, uh, Ohio EPA, who was on my time, was on my side, and the uh, Army Corps engineers, the top general, and the port director, Will Freeman of Cleveland Port, and we had a very long two-hour contentious meeting, but fruitful meeting, and I'm proud to say that that river has been dredged twice a year every year when I was in Congress. And I don't think it would have happened if I didn't wasn't had, 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 wasn't in the position to be able to make that change. One of the other things that you're also known for in your time in Congress was a really deep concern with overregulation by government of municipalities and also of private businesses. Yeah. Talk a little bit about your concern with overregulation. Well, I've always said that in a free market economy, we need some level of regulation, okay? Because you gotta keep things fair as possible, okay? You can't give certain entities an advantage or another entity unfairly. So, but we're so far past that, you know? So, uh, everybody says economic sense, or I like to say common sense too. Uh, if it doesn't 
pass a smell test, you kind of wonder what's going on here. But when you layer on regulations from different agencies on the same different industry sectors, and some of the, a lot of those regulations are duplicative. And, but so you got different agencies chasing after different you know businesses, different sectors, and it just adds to the cost and, and, and adds the ability not to get things done. And, and we all want to do the right thing. We all want clean water and clean air. Okay, uh, and I think we can get there because that's what most people want. There's there's very few people that out there doing the wrong thing. You know, but sometimes they need a little help. And and and, and I come from a soil and water conservation background. I was a Holmes County supervisor for a few years. And, you know, we do a lot of cost sharing and partnerships with the farmers. I was involved with Ohio State University, Ohio EPA, uh, soil and water with the first nutrient trading uh, program in the United States in my local area back when I was a state rep. Uh, and, and so there's things you can do to improve the environment and also grow the economy or the economic sector at the same time. And, and, and but if you have the heavy hand coming down there on everybody. I, you know, if somebody's out there doing the wrong thing and, you know, very, you know, really doing obviously bad things, they, the hammer needs to come down. But we don't need a bunch of bureaucrats out there running around. Uh, you know, sometimes you give bureaucrats a little bit of authority and they think they're a dictator. Mm-hmm. And I've seen that. And so, you know, I want uh, common sense regulations, but also help everybody do the right thing and then be able to grow the economy and create jobs. And, and we've, we've done that. And I've always said, too, a stronger economy protects the environment. You go to other countries around the world where they're suffering, you know, they're, 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 their biggest issue is how, where the next meal is going to come from. Their environment is, is a disaster. And we have the resources to put in sewage treatment plants, to put in infrastructure to protect our air and water, and mainly because we have a strong economy that provides those resources to do that. Before we continue with our conversation, I'd like to take a moment and ask you to learn a little more about the Ashbrook Center and how you can help us continue our work with teachers, students, and citizens. I'm Chad Kiefer, Director of Philanthropy and Strategic Partnerships here at Ashbrook. At its heart, America's story is about the lives of patriots who have given their last full measure of devotion to preserve and protect what it means to be an American. But the tragic truth is that the American story is being rewritten as one of oppression and despair. Back in 1776, the founders took a chance when they created a new government built on principles of liberty. They took a chance on America. Now I'm challenging you to do the same. Your gift to Ashbrook today reaches students, teachers, and citizens across the country, helping them to understand why America is worthy of their devotion. With so many forces eroding our history and taking away from our principles, isn't it time we give America a chance? Your investment is encouraged now more than ever. Please visit us today at ashbrook.org backslash support. Uh, your time in Congress and now, even as you're out now and looking forward, what are maybe maybe three, three of the biggest challenges that you think face the United States today? Oh, OK. I think internationally, uh, our foreign policy would be the Chinese Communist government. Mm-hmm. They're our biggest threat. They're, uh, they got this, I guess, called the Brandon's Roads Initiative. They've been doing this for years now, going around the world, uh, putting a whole bunch of money in ports in countries that that uh, don't have any resources and essentially buying those countries up and controlling them. So they, they want to control, you know, world commerce, you know, in a way. Uh, plus they steal uh, 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 intelligence, our, you know, our, our stuff from our country. Uh, so I think on the foreign, at the world level, the Chinese government, government, at the domestic level is our spending. Hmm. We can't continue spending trillions of dollars. I think when I came in Congress in 2011, I think the debt was like 10 trillion, now it's 31 trillion. I, and we talked about in 2011, I think $10 trillion debt was more debt than all the debt combined from all the presidents previously to President Obama. This is not sustainable. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think Thomas Jefferson said, you know, the thing that destroys us as a country could be our debt. Mm-hmm. And, and, so I think he's absolutely right. I think our founding fathers, you know, they were just, they were geniuses, but then they must have had some divine intervention in there too, because what they did and what they established a country that was founded on a, on an idea 
that people can govern themselves. Because you think about that, before we were founded as a country, everywhere else was either ruled by royalty or dictators. You know, I don't think there was any system of government where the people actually, you know, govern themselves. You, in your time in Congress, you, you chance to see these threats like the Chinese Communist government, like runaway uh, spending. And maybe it's fair to ask this. Um, what's the most disappointing thing to you about your time in Congress? What do you wish could have been done, should have been done, that wasn't able to get done? Well, when, I, I, let me maybe reverse that a little bit. Right. Okay, in 2017, I was on the Ways and Means Committee, but it was a major piece of legislation that I was involved as much as I could. We did the tax reform and tax cut bill, which actually put us in a strong economy all the way up until just recently. Uh, and so I think that was a big deal, even though I was on the committee, but I tried to have input. It was, it was great for farmers, small business, and households. And, and so, you know, really proud of that as a, in, at the macro, you know, 50,000-foot level. Uh, I guess, you know, disappointment is, I think it has to go back to spending. You know, we couldn't get spending under control. And, and you know, there's two types of spending. There's discretionary spending and mandatory spending. Mandatory spending is, you know, programs like Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, which I fully, 1,000% support. Discretionary spending is all the rest. Defense is discretionary spending, by the way, which, by the way, is probably the number one priority, or should be, I think it's in the Constitution, of the, of the function of the federal government, and postal roads are second, right? And so and that's discretionary spending. That kind of, that kind of blew me away when I realized that. Um, and so... We got to get the spending under control, mm. and and you can't do that by cutting discretionary spending unless you completely eliminate it. Because discretionary spending, I forget the percentage now, but it's probably twenty five percent, if that, of total spending. And so you keep, the math doesn't work. So the only way you get out of this mess is you got to uh, cut spending as where you can, where there's waste, because there's plenty of waste in, in a five trillion dollar budget or six trillion, whatever it is now, and grow the economy. So you take a $21 trillion economy and grow it at 3% and do the math and cut spending, you can grow your way out of this. You can't do it by cutting spending alone. So when somebody says we're going to cut spending and get there, uh, they're either uh, uninformed or they're lying to you. Mm. It's, it's mathematically impossible unless you eliminate programs like Social Security, which would be uh, a very bad thing to do. First of all, there's a contract with the people that paid in, so it's an economic contract and it's a moral contract. Mm. And, and it'd be political suicide for any politician to, 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 say, to say they're going to cut Social Security. Absolutely wrong thing to do. So the Ashbrook Center, as you know, one of our great, we're an educational center. One of the great things we're, our mission is to help educate our fellow Americans in the history and founding principles of our country. We really think it's a vital, important mission. Um, Ronald Reagan said in his farewell address, we have to have informed patriotism, people who love the country because they understand why it's lovable. Yeah. So we always like to ask our guests, uh, as a last question, who is their favorite person in American history? Well, you know, there's some people in American history, there's a lot that have done a lot of good things. Absolutely. And, you know, George Washington, for somebody that uh, uh, could have been the king, and he said, no, I'm going back home. And, you know, that was a special person, especially when you put in what was going on that time, that, that time in our period. And, of course, what Abraham Lincoln went through, you know. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I got to credit Harry Truman for deciding to make that, that decision to drop the bomb. Uh, I might not be here. My dad was a navigator in B-24 in the Pacific uh, in World War II, and... You know, he would have he been he would have been on flights, uh, a bomb in Japan if the bomb wasn't dropped. So, uh, my 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 wife's father was at Pearl Harbor during the bombing on one of the ships, and he survived. But there's a lot of great. But I, I'm going to have to say probably Ronald Reagan, because I I was a young adult when Ronald Reagan was became president. I can remember him telling Gorbachev to tear down the wall over there in Berlin, Berlin, and I I remember the day he was shot. You know, he was a communicator. It must have been because his background as an actor, you know. And you know, it was interesting, you know, he used to be a Democrat in California, which 
uh, which I guess is a totally, totally different t- Democrat than the, the ones out there today. <laughs> the Democrat Party has changed so much. But, uh, you know, he did, uh, and he did, he, he did a tax cut. He put us on the prosperity, which, uh, economic prosperity for a long time, time, which I think Bill Clinton got credit for. <laughs> because it takes time to turn this aircraft carrier around, right? And so uh, I think, you know, well-respected president um, and did the right thing. And, and, and since I was alive when he was president in my more formative years, had an impact on, on some of my thinking. And uh, But we've had some great, great leaders in this country, and that's one of the reasons why we're such a great country. Well, Ronald Reagan inaugurated the Ashbrook Center, as you know, in 1983. Right. So Ronald Reagan's always a good answer <laughs> on an, in an Ashbrook I remember when he came here for that. I was home <laughs> uh, listening to it about in her press. I, I, I wasn't here, obviously, then, but um, I remember that when he came here. That was a big, that was a big deal. <laughs> You've had a distinguished career in public service. What's your advice to our listeners, maybe even especially our younger listeners, who might be thinking about going into public service? Well, my advice has always been when I've talked to uh, younger people, um, first thing I tell them, like I told some of the Ashbrook scholars this afternoon, I said, you know, get learn as much as you possibly can. Get that foundation and build on that. Because if you don't build on that, with all the changes going on, the technological changes, you'll fall behind. So it's a lifelong uh, learning experience. So I think that's important. And now some people say they want to go right into politics. Well, that's fine, but maybe it's to me it depends how you do it. Okay, I just don't think that you graduate from college at I don't know what, 22 years old. Well, you couldn't even run for Congress; you got to be 25 to be a member of Congress. So I guess that holds it back a little bit. Uh, but I tell them you need to get some experience, it's business experience, political experience, whatever it may be. You know, uh, run for a, a lower office, get some of that experience because. Remember, when you're a legislator at any level, you're passing laws that affect everybody's daily life, okay? Hopefully in a positive way. But if you don't have the experience, experience is big, education, all that's big too, but experience is big. I mean, there's so much experience, business experience, family experience, raising a family. I mean, if you haven't gone, to, you know, so I, I think, you know, I'd like to see people Take a few years to get a to d- develop a resume other than just their education, and it might be in business. It could be in the public sector, it could be in elected office at a lower level, not not at a level where you're passing laws that you know, have a, a bigger effect, and and get that get that experience. It's a life experience. I guess we'd call it life experience, and because I don't think legitimately you're really in the right position if you don't have some of that life experience to go to Congress and pass laws. And, and I think, you know, in some instances, that's, there's some problem, that's some of the problem. We've got people, members of Congress today, that don't have a clue of what's going on. <laughs> I, I, I mean, but it, it does. I think it's important because when you, because I also always said, uh, what three factors do you look at if you decide how to vote, okay? And, you know, first was actually, is it constitutional? We should not knowingly pass legislation that's not constitutional. Now, obviously, you get in the gray area there, and that's why we have the judicial system, because you can't pass laws to to uh, micromanage everything. So that things come up, and that's where the judicial system subsist, specifically hones in on its you know, tunnel vision, where ours is widespread. And so it's constitutional. We should not knowingly do that. Then second... Is it is a good if it passes constitutional test? Is it good policy? Good public policy, and the third is, is is a political question. Is it good politics? But that's third, not first. Well, that's very good advice, yeah. Congressman Bob Gibbs. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Enjoyed being here. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the American Idea. If you enjoyed this episode, remember to subscribe at Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and leave a five-star review. If you want to learn more or get involved in Ashbrook's vital work, visit our website, ashbrook.org.